So, in the events of ventricular systole, remember systole means contract, diastole means relax. So during the events of ventricular systole, we've got the contraction of the ventricles closing the AV valves and opening the semilunar valves and it ejects blood from the heart. The end diastolic volume, so diastole, relaxing. So the end diastolic volume is the volume of blood just before it contracts. How full are my ventricles before they start to squeeze? The end systolic volume is the volume of blood after they contract. You have to remember, I can't eject every single droplet of blood out of the heart. That would be like me saying, I have a sopping wet sponge and me squeezing it makes it go dry. It doesn't. There's still some water left over. So even with the strongest ventricular contraction that my heart can make, there's still just a little bit of volume left. So when we talk about the in systolic volume, we're talking about how much is left after I've done my little squeezy squeezy with my ventricles. Ventricular diastole. Diastole means relax. So the relaxation of the ventricles results in closing of the semilunar valves, opening of the atrioventricular valves, and movement of blood into the ventricles. Remember that suction, um, I'm sorry, the baby aspirator, the little sucky snot thing for a baby. As that relaxes, it causes that vacuum that sucks the snot out of the baby's nose, right? Most blood movement occurs when it moves from that higher pressure in the veins and atria to the lower pressure, the sucking, relaxing ventricles. So the majority of the volume that moves is caused by the relaxation of the ventricles, whereas the atria themselves, squeezing, just kind of tops it off and completes whatever's gonna be moving. I'm sure that you've heard heart sounds before, the bum bum, bum bum. Bum, 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 bum. Well, when you hear about it, you'll hear them say lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. And I think most people think it's actually the contraction that's making the noise, and believe it or not, it's not. It's actually the smacking closed of the two different types of valves. So the first sound, the lighter sound, the bum, 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 that top bum sound is actually the slapping closed of the atrioventricular valves. So we're talking about the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves. Whereas that second sound, bum bum, that one is actually going to be the semilunar valve smacking shut. There is a possibility of having a third sound, but that third sound is actually going to be turbulent blood flow. You can hear kind of, it, it's almost like a whistling sound or a fuzzy sound that isn't that same lub-dub, lub-dub. And there are kind of two explanations for it. It can be considered, well, okay, so there's one explanation. Somewhere blood is flowing when it shouldn't, so we call that turbulent blood flow. But at the same time, it could be that one of the valves is leaking, or it could be that there's a hole somewhere so there's blood flowing when there shouldn't be. We call that a heart murmur. And oftentimes babies will have a heart murmur. We kind of talked about this when I talked about the um, foramen ovale um, for, or I'm sorry, the fossa ovalis. Or it might be the same thing, just two different names for the same thing. Fossa ovalis is what I'm gonna go with though. Um, the fact that since babies don't breathe inside the womb, they don't have to send anything to the left ventricle. So it just goes from the right side, I'm sorry, to the lungs. So it just goes from the right side to the left side and then out to the body. And when the baby is born in a perfect world with unicorns and dragons, that hole should completely and seamlessly shut the minute the baby is born. But in reality, it doesn't work that way. So sometimes there's a little hole that will heal over time. It's not deadly or anything. But that little hole, when the baby is first born, will make that extra sound. Mean arterial blood pressure. So what does mean actually define as? It means the average. So the average arterial blood pressure. Do not think we're going to have to do any type of mathematics, because this isn't a math class. Don't panic. So 
The mean arterial blood pressure is the average blood pressure, and we're normally talking about in the aorta. So the mean arterial blood pressure is a combination of two things, the cardiac output and the peripheral resistance. Now cardiac output is how much blood is being pumped through the heart per minute. So if I wanted to break that down even further, I could say the heart rate and the stroke volume. Heart rate. What's a rate? How fast something happens, right? So in this case with the heart rate, how many beats per minute? Is it 70? Is it 75? Is it 60 in the well-trained athlete? And then stroke volume. What's volume? How much, right? Stroke in this case, we're talking about um, how much is moving per actual squeeze, per stroke. So the stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped through the heart per beat. The heart rate is how many beats per minute. So if you multiply those two numbers together, you actually get the cardiac output. How much blood am I moving per minute? So the stroke volume is equal to the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. Remember that there's a difference between what you're actually moving and what you leave behind. You can't completely empty it. You can't completely dry that sponge. There's always going to be a little bit of moisture left, even if I squeeze it as hard as I possibly can. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. <clears throat> the venous return is the amount of blood coming into the heart, and it increases the stroke volume. So if I've got a little, a little bit of water in a sponge and I squeeze it, I'm not going to get much out of it. However, if I have a sopping wet sponge and I squeeze it with the same amount of pressure, a lot more water is going to come out of it because I started off with more. So the venous return, how much blood you're actually putting into the heart to begin with, will actually increase the amount of the stroke volume, how much is being ejected. Um, as well as that, increased ventricular contraction can also increase stroke volume. So you're going to have to imagine with me, because you can't see me, imagine taking a rubber band and putting it like you're going to shoot the rubber band across the room, and you only separate your two fingers, let's say, by three inches, and you let it go. Three inches isn't really that far, so when the rubber band recoils, it's not going to recoil with a lot of force. However, if I take my fingers with the same rubber band and I actually, let's say I, I stretch that rubber band 12 inches before I shoot it, it's probably going to shoot all the way across the room because the amount of force that it bounces back with is a lot harder with that distance. When it comes down to it, the more you stretch the heart out with volume, the harder it bounces back. So that can also increase stroke volume, how much is actually being ejected per beat. Now, peripheral resistance. What is your peripheral vision? It's the sides, right? And of course, what's resistance? It's basically going to be preventing something, right? So peripheral resistance is the total resistance to blood flow through the blood vessels. The best way I can think to describe this is using plumbing as an example. If I have a pipe and it is a brand spanking new clean pipe and I'm running water through it, it's going to run through without any issue because there's nothing to prevent it from flowing. However, if I have a dirty, nasty, corroded, sided pipe and I'm trying to put the same volume that would flow through that clean pipe, it wouldn't flow as easily and would probably back up because there's actually resistance to it flowing because there's all the gobbledygook on the side. When it comes to our blood moving, peripheral resistance is part of it. If we have plaques in our arteries or we have um, let's say deposits in our arteries, calcified deposits, it can actually slow our blood flow down and it will resist the ability of our blood to flow. It'll slow it down. Um, our cardiac reserve. So what's a reserve? It's like a savings account, right? You've got a little bit of extra if you need it. Not that I have a savings account, but just go with me on it. Okay. With your cardiac reserve, there is a difference between how hard your 
heart beats, how much volume your heart is moving when you're sitting watching Dancing with the Stars versus being in a Zumba class. That difference between your heart working as hard as it possibly can and you're relaxing in front of the television is the reserve. I don't beat like I'm at Zumba when I'm watching TV, but I can if I have to. It's in reserve if I'm running away from, I don't know, a mountain lion. Does that make sense? I hope. Okay. If not, rewind it, listen to it again, or you can always text me or email me. So let's talk about some things that actually affect your mean arterial blood pressure. Okay, decreased blood pressure, decreased blood pH, increased carbon dioxide, decreased blood oxygen, exercise and emotions. Okay, if I'm scared, what's that gonna do? What part of my nervous system is that gonna activate? sympathetic, so my fight or flight. It's going to decrease my parasympathetic and it's going to increase the amount of epi and norepi, adrenaline. If you increase the amount of adrenaline in your body, what's going to happen to your heart? It's going to increase its rate. It's also going to increase how fast, or I'm sorry, not how fast, how hard it's squeezing, so it's going to increase the force of the contraction. By increasing the rate, I'm increasing cardiac output. By increasing the force, I'm increasing stroke volume. All of this put together means that my average blood pressure is going to go up because I'm stressed out. Now, increased blood volume, exercise, um, change from standing to lying down. All of these things are going to increase how much blood you have going into your heart, how much volume, how much preload. Now remember what I said about that rubber band. Not only am I putting more fluid in the heart to begin with, but because I'm putting more fluid, it's stretching it out more, meaning that it bounces back a lot harder. We call that increased force of contraction Starling's law of the heart, basically meaning that because I'm putting more in, that stroke volume is going to go up, which ultimately means that my blood pressure is going to go up. Now in chapter 21, we're going to talk about the fact that I can basically control how big or how small the diameter of my arteries are. I can make those tubes that are my arteries get smaller or I can make them relax and get bigger. When that happens, let's say I make them smaller, I'm increasing that peripheral resistance. Now remember from back here, if I increase this number, this number also goes up. So when I increase this number, it increases my mean arterial blood pressure.